If I were to declare to you that sin is pathetic, well, what would come to your mind? And sin is pathetic because sin is the transgression of God's law, either sins of omission or sins of commission. It's the greatest enemy any one of us has because it's the only thing there is in all of man's history that can separate us from God. We have the sin problem. If God were totally just and that's all there was about him, there'd be no hope for anybody. But God is also merciful and gracious. And he and he alone in his omniscience, great eternal wisdom, could come up with a plan whereby justice demands that every one of us should be sent to a devil's hell and we have nobody to blame but ourselves, Romans 3.23 and Romans 6.23. But he found the only way, to put it in human terminology, found the only way that a just God could save people who justice said ought to go into eternal perdition. And that simple declaration is that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16 And John himself also said earlier in John 1 verse 1 In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God continued to say the same was in the beginning with God. Without him was not anything made that was made. Then in verse 14, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He would declare that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me, John 14, 6. He made it very clear in John 8, 24 to the Jews and to all men, except you believe that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. And thus, he's the only way for man who deserves to be sentenced to devil's hell to escape that place. He is the epitome of the grace, love, and mercy of our Heavenly Father. If you go back to the Old Testament, especially to the book of Lamentations, you'll see that it is a classic Old Testament study concerning the deep sorrow that sin always brings. We must remember that no one sins without suffering the consequences of sin. You may be forgiven of them, and to go to heaven you must be, and on God's terms. But there are consequences of sin. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after death, the judgment, Hebrews 9, 27. Sins in the world because men sin. And death is separation from God. Now, what separates us from God? Sin. Who sins? Men sin, that is, mankind. And all have sinned, Romans 3, 23. Men going about their lives as if there's not much ever going to be any different than what we know in the flesh. Whether they're quite young or in their early adult years or middle-aged or old or whatever, there's something about us that makes us think, well, here we are and it won't change. And yet all the time the facts are saying 
They're changing every second. And you're getting close to the end of this life. What does a person do without any recognition of what God's done for us we never could do for ourselves to save us from sin? Well, he tries to drive from his mind his own death. He tries to drive from his mind standing before a son of God who loved us and gave himself for us to save us from our sins. And he just thinks, well, maybe, you know, somebody will even find how scientifically we won't have to die. How foolish we are. Sin is pathetic. In Isaiah chapter 57, and verse 21, the scripture reads, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Now, people may appear to be quite peaceful, and some of the most wicked folks on earth, but they're not. They're not peaceful at all. People find refuge in deceiving themselves. That is in believing lies. And because of that, they have a corrupted, messed up, if you want to put it that way, conscience, and their whole mind is skewed and it can't even cause them to lose their minds because they will not face the reality of their situation. Now, the gospel comes to us, and it does one great thing for every person that listens and understands. It causes that person to face reality. Reality is not easy to face. Some things in life are easy to face. But throughout life and what life's all about in the flesh and so on, it is not that easy for some people, to, maybe most people to face. When people decide to become Christians, like the New Testament describes people becoming Christians, that is converted to Jesus Christ, converted to his way of thinking, his life, complying with the mandates of Prince Emmanuel concerning how he extends salvation, forgiveness of sins to us. When people actually undergo conversion, then they have changed their whole outlook on everything. First of all, themselves. When a person decides to obey the gospel, they've had to come to grips with the reality of their lost condition, separated from God. It's their fault. They can't blame anybody but themselves. Other people may have had a hand in it, but they let them have a hand in it. They yielded, just like Eve yielded to the lies of Satan. Then Adam abdicated his authority as the head of the race, paid no attention to what she was doing, and just took the forbidden fruit and ate it. Nevertheless, deceived or not, they both transgressed God's will and sin was upon them. Evil had gained such a hold upon Judah's heart that there was no genuine place of repentance to be found in the nation. Though God bore with them for hundreds and hundreds of years, evidencing his love for them and is long-suffering, giving them opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to repent of their sins and come back to him. But, but they didn't. And finally, they would be ripped out of their home and taken into Babylonian captivity. To sing the Lord's song in a strange land as they were in Babylonia. Open their eyes to what had happened to them. Psalm 137 and verse 4. I think it's interesting that the late songwriter, Brother T. S. Tedley, wrote a beautiful song along this line. 
Here we live in hope of a better land where the dread of death can never come. Neither pain nor sign, no sad goodbyes ever enter that heavenly home. For we wait in peace for the happy dawn of that morn of eternal life. We're Christians if we've from the heart believed the gospel, believe that Christ Jesus is the Son of the living God. And all that the Bible says that he came to do and did, even under the cross when he said, on that cross it is finished i've done all that god sent me to do to save man i've done everything for them they couldn't do and so he went into the grave but being free from sin tempted at every point like as we are he rose from the grave because death could not hold him on the third day and after a little while longer on the earth he ascended to heaven and as Peter declared in Acts 2, at the beginning of the church, the establishment of his great kingdom, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Peter and the rest of the apostles, guided by the Holy Spirit, declared the gospel to those people. And they in humble, contrite hearts, though they were devout Jews, doing the best they could under the law of Moses to approach God, for that's all they knew. They recognized what they had done, and in all honesty, Luke 8, verse 15, they cried out to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? He took them as believers in Christ and told them to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38. And verse 41 says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. May I pause here and point out that anyone that ever gladly receives the word, the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11, the gospel, God's power to save, Romans 1, 16, as those people did of whom Luke, by inspiration, wrote there in Acts 2. Anytime anybody gladly receives the word as they did, they will repent and be baptized to obtain the forgiveness or remission of sins. Now, sin, forgiveness of sin takes place in the mind of God. He's the one we offended. And so it is, Jesus offers us through the plan of salvation an opportunity of forgiveness. There is no other opportunity. There's nobody else. There's no other doctrine. There's no other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must, that's imperative, can't get around it. We must be saved. If you want salvation from sin, if you want heaven to be your home, if you want to miss hell and all of its horrors, then you must believe that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God with such a belief that you'll take him further at his word and obey him when one is taught to repent of sins and confess one's faith in Christ, Romans 10, 10, complete one's obedience to the great gospel of Christ by being baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Now it's in Christ where our God has located all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, Ephesians 1, 3. But to get into Christ, one must be baptized into Christ. Galatians 3, verses 26, especially verse 27. Now, if we want the eternal light and life that is for all who will adhere to the truth of the gospel and be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as we know, our labor is not in vain. Now, where? In the Lord. 1 Corinthians 50, 58, then we will receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save our soul. What's able to save our soul? The engrafted word, the seed of the kingdom, 
the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, Ephesians 6, 17. Now the word of God is quick and powerful. That is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow. Now listen. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 4.12. No wonder Paul told Timothy, preach the word. Oh, nobody can do that kind of insightful investigation of another person's soul, save God through the instrument the Spirit uses, which is the Word of God. There's not a person, as I said earlier, who's ever been converted like the New Testament describes conversion, who's ever become a Christian like the New Testament describes one becoming a Christian, that has not come to grips with the reality, I'm lost, and I'm undone, and I have no one to blame but me. And yet God loves me. God cares for me. God implores me, as Christ said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Listen to what is said in Job 3. And verse 17, he speaks of a place. We know it is heaven. And he says, where the wicked cease from troubling and the weary are at rest. Jesus says, and I will give you rest. Rest in that you know you're reconciled to your father. Rest because you know you responded to the love of God by obedience to the gospel. Rest because you're in Christ. And before you pillow your head and drift off to sleep every night, you can say, my father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And you can commit yourself to him through faith and obedience to the truth. And as a Christian, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. A member of the church Jesus purchased with his blood, Acts 20 and 28, the one he built, Matthew 16, 18, and Acts 2. You can in God's family, which is that church, 1 Timothy 3, 15, rest assured that though you may not see the sun rise in the morning, if you take your journey into eternity tonight, peace and security, Happiness beyond man's mind to grasp will be yours when you shuffle off this mortal coil and enter into the place where time means nothing and has no control. Material things aren't there and there's no space as we know it on this old earth. But you enter into a place, Paul said, which is far better because you're with Christ. How much better that is than the way most people live their lives on earth. Most people live their lives grabbing for everything there is here instead of trusting the creator with all their hearts. Proverbs 3, 5, and 7. They put all their hopes, their expectations, their desires, their aspirations in this present world, and it won't do any good. They have, as it were, with all their wages, Put it in a bag full of holes. That guy won verse six. There's no better commentary of their plight that can be found than in Second Chronicles 36 and verse 16. The scripture reads, but they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of God arose against his people, till there was no remedy. Someone has said a long, long time ago that justice is a fine thing that we cannot pay too dearly for it. Well, I say to you, 
Judah of old learned the high price. We must always pay for the pathetic sins we commit. And when we reject the overtures of our Heavenly Father through Christ and the gospel to give us peace through our own adherence to the truth and going on through life until eternal life is our reality. So I hope these words have encouraged us all to be more mindful of spiritual matters and as members of the church to be more determined to study the Bible, spend our time in prayer, learning better how to reach the souls that need it with the gospel with an earnest desire to do so. Now, would you bow with me for a word of prayer as we close this particular talk? Holy and righteous Father, as we go through these wonderful words of life, we recognize how weak we are and how much we need the truth and by love and mercy, long-suffering. And we pray that that would help us to hate sin. Help us, Father, to hate even any spot of sin. But to look to Jesus, the author and finish of our faith, in obedience to his will from the heart, that we might walk covered by the blood that's his blood, that our sins might be washed away. And we can always know that thou art with us and will be through Christ with us until the end. For we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.